am I? My name is Eric Stewart, and I am a nature lover. I'm a, let me pull this up so it gets a little bit better. I'm a nature lover. I went to SPC in 2008, and around that time I started learning about permaculture. I was studying biology. I was going to uh, Mrs. Giraffe's class, and I was studying about um, evolution and population. And then at home, I was gardening in my yard, trying to learn about that in my own property. Um, I studied permaculture since 2008, and then I enrolled in a permaculture design course, which is a 72-hour course, where they go really, really in-depth into permaculture. And you basically live at a site for like those 72 hours. And it, the site that we went to was called Sacred Lands down in St. Petersburg. It's an absolutely beautiful place. It's actually a preserve on top of like an ancient uh, bur uh, burial mound. Um, I think the native Indians in this area, Tocobongo, maybe you can pronounce it better if you know. Tocobongo, they the, the Native Americans that lived in this area. They used to build these huge mounds of shellfish, and they would cover it up. And if you go to some of the parks here in Pinellas, you can see these huge mounds, like uh, Anderson Park and Sacred Lands. Philippi. Philippi Anderson, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So this place had a very sacred meaning to it, and then we spent these 72 hours learning about biology and how to incorporate permaculture. Um, in, ta in around that time, I founded an online community for permaculture called Co Green Community, and I started taking YouTubes, and that's why I'm YouTubing this right now. And I've been taking recordings of small farms, uh, permaculture projects, what people are doing at their own homes, and in community groups all around Tampa. Uh, so I've been to St. Petersburg, Clearwater, Dunedin. I've been to Tampa and Hillsborough, trying to see what are people doing in this area and trying to spread it as much as possible to other people. Uh, I've been an environmental and social activist. I was part of the Occupy movement. I went over there when the Occupy started in 2011, and I uh, tried to also get myself involved with as much social justice and environmental justice stuff that I can. Um, one, come the, some of the projects I'm working on in Pasco County, we're trying to legalize chickens. Uh, right now, you are, are not allowed to actually have chickens if you live in Pasco County unless you're an agricultural zone. So we're trying to allow chickens in people's backyards as, as pets. Um, in 2012, I created a worker-owned food cooperative, meaning that the people that work at the cooperative own the cooperative. Rather than one person owning it, all of us kind of own it and we work together. And we bring local food from small farms into Newport Ritchie. And now we just opened up a, a customer pickup at Tarpon Springs at Simply Fresh, right over on Klosterman and Alter 19. So you can order food online. You can pick it up from small farms if you want. If you want to get involved in this, the best way to do it is to use your dollar bills and eat local food and eat, eat sustainable food if possible. Which kind of brings me to another point. I brought in some strawberries. They're organic and they're from Plant City. Help yourself. It's a gift for everyone that's here. So if anyone wants some, help yourself. Um, so these are the, uh, different pictures and logos of, of the websites I created. But I also have been converting my front yard. Can you all see that good? Uh, I've been growing sweet potatoes and fruit trees and vegetables in my front yard trying to get others to grow food rather than lawn. Because we use all these absorbent amounts of resources to grow lawn and it doesn't provide us anything. If we could start growing food, then we could start providing for our community and for our local neighborhoods. And so it's kind of a movement and it's something that's been going on worldwide really. Um, and I also take YouTubes of my garden. There's my dog. <laughs> um, so why do we want permaculture? What is, why, what is the necessity for permaculture? Um, and I have a premise that I'd like to say, and I think this is my opinion. Uh, industrial agriculture is inherently unsustainable. Uh, if we want to survive as a species, we have to learn to work together and create a whole new culture. And I'd like to identify some things, and I'd like to just make a point, and then I'd like to give you the resources to go investigate it yourself. You don't have to believe me. All I'm trying to do is put together a map and different points and show it to you, and then you can take it upon yourself to learn 
and discredit it or uh, validate it. Um, what I'd like to first start off with is what is culture? Culture is a people enacting a story. We are all captives to a civilizational system that more or less compels you to go on destroying the world in order to live. And so 10,000 years ago, we started this culture called agriculture. If you were to look at the root word of agri, it means from Greece, field. Um, and then horti or horticultural means plants, care. So you either have field care where you're tending huge fields of agriculture, or you have plant care. Um, to go, kind of go backwards, 10,000 years ago, we started a culture where we started to think that we had the right to own the world and we could do with the world whatever we wanted. And so we started this culture of agriculture where we would destroy forests and plant only food for human beings to survive on and develop that into an agricultural system. But for hundreds of thousands of years, even millions of years, we were living in a nomadic, hunter-gatherer way of living. We were also living in a horticultural way of living where we would have small gardens and we would develop fruit trees and propagate them. So we, we developed out of that hunter-gatherer into a horticultural type culture and into the past 10,000 years, this agricultural system that we all survive on. And so this led to a different splitting. Um, a lot of indigenous cultures see themselves a part of nature. And in our culture, we kind of alienate ourselves. We separate ourselves from culture. There's the wilderness or nature, and then there's the human world and civilization. And so what I want to say to all of us is we live within nature, and we need nature to survive. And so if we are to survive as a species, 9 billion of us projected by 2050, we're going to have to learn to survive within the nat natural uh, ecosystem. And so this culture, it originated 10,000 years ago. And there's two really good books I'd like to point out. One is called Ishmael. Has anyone possibly read Ishmael? No? OK, so this is a new book for you. It's a really good book about a gorilla that puts an ad out in the newspaper asking for volunteers to help him save the world. And so it's this story of a talking gorilla talking about how human beings have changed from the natural environment into this human environment that we've created. And he tells this story, and the author of it is Daniel Quinn. He's a biologist. And he talks about agriculture, and he talks about uh, our history as a human species. And then Ryan Eisler, I got interested in Ryan at, in 2008 when I was in school. I read about her. She wrote The Chalice and the Blade. It's an alternative story about 10,000 years ago about this split that happened and why, we, why did we start agriculture? Why did we start taking over nature and making it human food and only human food? So this is, I'm just trying to plant some seeds. I hope you all take some time and read these books. They're really good books and they'll really make you think differently about the world in general. And so the, the two books together, they talk about culture and how we have kind of a dominator culture. We have an authoritarian system where 1% of humanity owns 99, or excuse me, 90% of all of the land and wealth and resources. And sometimes they have high degrees of abuse and violence in some of these cultures. Uh, sometimes there's a subordination of women and femininity. You know, over the past 100 years, we've transformed a lot. It was only, a not even 100 years ago, women couldn't vote, and they were seen as kind of property for uh, uh, males. You know, you would get married to a, uh, husband, and that's how you gained up into society. But now we're learning that women are equal to men, and you know we're not. There is no men above women. You know we're trying to create a more egalitarian society, and this is something that's been progressive over the past uh, ten thousand years, really. Um, so these beliefs and stories that we constantly hear in the background of our society, like if you turn on the radio or if you watch a movie. The culture, the stories that our culture tells you, they reinforce these ideas. They reinforce the idea that we're separate from nature and that there's a hierarchy in, in the world and that human beings are at the top of that hierarchy. And so what I'd like to say is that we are completely connected to the world and we are in partnership with the world and we have to find ways to, to live within that. 
And so that's what permaculture kind of teaches. So this culture, it reinforces all of us to enact this story. And in this story, we, we use food, energy, and water. And how we do that is how our culture tells us to enact the story. So with food, we have been desertificating the, um, in, uh, basically the entire planet. Like I mentioned before, what we do is we tear down forests, we clear cut them, destroying everything that's in that area, and plant only food for human beings. And so for the past 200 years, this is a map of all the forests, in 1620, there were virgin forests all around uh, the United States of America. And then slowly, at, oh, for the past 400 years till present, you know, we have been developed, destroying these forests and converting it into resources for our human economy. And so for us to continue to survive, we have to create a place for a wilderness to survive. And you know, the past couple hundred years, we've been creating parks, and, and developing areas specifically for wilderness. So it's important that we have a place for nature to be and to integrate within nature. Um, so this is a, a picture of the rainforest. This is actually a piece of rainforest that was clear cut and it's now growing corn. And this corn gets grown and then shipped to China and then they feed it to cows and pigs. And then we transport that those cows and pigs over here to America and it becomes a McDonald's meal. You know, we have this global economic system that moves around resources, and we use it in a very uh, ineffective, um, wasteful way. We actually make money on waste. The more waste that we can make, the more money that we generate, because there's that's just how our, our economy works at the present moment. Um, so here's a picture of the Amazon These satellite images show the rapid rate of deforestation in Brazil from 2000 to 2007. Global deforestation accounts for about 20% of annual carbon dioxide emissions and is directly tied to climate change. So deforestation is occurring all around the world and desertification is happening. So every time that we destroy these forests, we set back the ecological time to the lowest level of, of, of biology. You know, you, um, later on I'll tell you more about that. So going on to the next one, I want to move quickly because this is a very big thing topic, but the next thing is um, energy. I'm sorry, this is not clicking. Those are some movies if you want to watch. What is peak oil? So this idea that there's a, only a finite amount of oil on this planet, and it, over time that we were are taking these resources out of the planet, they will eventually plateau in production and eventually decline in production year after year. So right now, um, I'm 28 years old, and I heard a quotation, if you are over 25 years old, you have seen about uh, fifty percent of all the world's oil used in your lifetime and if you are ten years old you've seen about twenty five percent of all of the, the history of oil that we've ever used has been used in a ten year old's lifetime we are exponentially growing and because of this rate of exponential growth we're using more and more oil faster and faster so I'm not talking about the tomorrow the, the oil is going to run out um, I'm looking longer term, 100 years, 200 years. When will our oil supply start to plateau and start to decline in production? So right now, some of the areas that we're getting our oil from um, are really expensive to acquire, but we can do it. We have a glut of oil right now, but it's really expensive to get to, and so it's gonna be higher and higher costs for all of us living in the economy. Um, so the tar sands right now, we're transforming boreal forest into uh, tar sands to get scrape oil uh, out of bitumen when we, there's a process to it and so I'm, just, I'm trying to connect a lot of different things but in science in, in um, thermodynamics you have to use energy to get work out of any type of system so we have to put more and more energy into the systems to uh, get oil out of the ground and eventually it's going to be really really expensive so this is going on 
um, climate change, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slightly go over that, but the climate, I believe, is changing. Um, they're projecting that over the next 50 years, there'll be a two degree difference, and that's in Celsius. So how much is that in Fahrenheit? Is that almost like six or seven? So six or seven degrees Fahrenheit difference and change. 2012, we had the worst drought in history. A lot of farmlands in California had to shut off because they weren't producing anything because of the massive droughts that are going on, uh, which ties up into the next element. Um, also, what is going to happen to Florida? So if the climate changes and the glaciers change, uh, start to melt or green, Greenland starts to melt, uh, this would be one meter shoreline. You can see parts of Miami, parts of Tampa, all throughout Florida. 10% of the land area, 1.5 million people will be displaced if the sea levels do rise, if the scientists are correct and the projections are correct. And this is two meters, and you can see three meters, four meters, and then five, and so forth. And this is six meters. So basically, this would have to be all Greenland and all of Antarctica to raise the sea levels uh, six meters. So this is like an absolute worst case scenario. I personally don't feel that the, the rate of change, it's, it's more likely that we're going to see a one meter change over the next hundred years. That's what they're projecting is one meter uh, sea level rise over the next hundred years. So there's variables, you know? It's how fast are we changing the systems and how, what is the rate of change? How much oil are we gonna consume and then burn and then put carbon dioxide into the air? And so the quicker that we transform our economy, the quicker we can um, take hold of uh, our future, basically. And then water. Um, there was a sinkhole that happened just a few weeks ago where a guy was in his bedroom and all of a sudden, the, the ground collapsed underneath of them and a sinkhole opened up. Why are these sinkholes happening? And one of the reasons why is because we depend on the aquifer. And this water um, is actually a scarce resource. It took thousands and thousands of years to be put into that aquifer. And we are, with our rate of change, the amount that we're sucking out of the aquifer is a lot more than it's being replenished. So they say that the aquifer can sustain sustainably 8 million people in the state of Florida, and there are currently 18 million people in the state of Florida with a projected growth of over 36 million by the end of 2050. So like if we're going to keep growing our economy, we're going to see and hit these real natural boundaries. We're going to hit boundaries with our food, with our water, and with our energy as we continue these unsustainable systems. So what I'd like to propose is we should probably stop accepting business as usual at some point considering business as usual is killing the human race and a lot of animals too. So how can we make a better future together? And that's what I like about permaculture is it's a very positive solution base. So what is permaculture? Hi, I'm... I'm sorry, this is a video I'd like to show. It's about three minutes long. Uh, permaculture is approached designing human settlements and agricultural systems that are modeled on relationships found in nature. So I'm going to give you a toolbox of ideas and concepts that you can start to use. So like I was talking about the agriculture system. This is a, a, a graph about ecology over time. What we do in agriculture is we start at that number one. We clear cut all, everything and we transform it into an annual crop. And what permaculture says is we should stay at the number six part. We should create mature forests that we can grow our food, our medicine, all of the resources for our economy out of, as well as providing a place for nature to live and survive in. And this will create a system that we can live within and we can also um, depend upon to create our economy. So one way that we do that in permaculture is we create food forests. We create a small space. You can create lots of food by leveling it, using your vertical levels, growing plants that uh, will climb up trees, growing plants that will stay on the close um, ground, our cover crops. 
uh, having a surface layer of, of different herbs and plants and shrubs that you can, you can have an interaction with all of this too. They can create a community and an ecosystem in your own yard so that they can continue to keep themselves going. And one thing is called is a kill. So in a permaculture, we try and look at how plants and animals interact. And you can have plants that work together in symbiotic relationships and help them grow more. So you don't need fertilizer. You don't need watering in a food forest. You, if you look at the forest, no one goes out there and sprays pesticides. No one waters it. But it takes care of itself, and it's thriving, and it's an ecosystem. And we can be a part of that ecosystem, and that's what permaculture talks about. And we can use the ecosystem as a predator. We are the apex species. We're the top dog on this pyramid scheme of where our energy comes from. So in order for us to continue it, we have to be the best predator by creating the most amount of ecosystem underneath of us. So we want lots of animals. We want lots of plants. We want lots of insects because they provide us with our food. So in, we're trying to change the system from destroying nature to being a part of nature. And if you don't mind, I'm going to show you this three-minute video. It's about a guy named Jim Kovaleski who has been doing permaculture for over seven years in downtown Newport Ritchie. It's really inspiring, and he is who got me into permaculture. I'm Irene Mayer, your host for Florida Matters. Here's an encore segment from one of our previous episodes. Jim Kovaleski is a farmer, and his fields are the yards around his house in the suburbs of Newport Ritchie. I do a market garden here. I planted uh, in October and um, started harvesting in December. He seems to embody the idea of sustainable living. But I'm actually surviving on a piece of land I occupy. There's an interaction going on, which is so different than the, our traditional suburban and urban mentality. I'm actually producing something in off a piece of land I'm occupying. Where most people grow decorative plants, shrubs, and border grass, Jim cultivates a variety of delicious leafy greens alongside carrots, radishes, and the rest of his winter crop. He grows his produce to sell at area farmers markets and to share and trade with his neighbors. Food really transcends a lot of barriers. I really fond of people, especially when I show up on my bicycle. I also distribute around the neighborhood. More lettuce. Sweet. You got grapefruit? Yes, I do. Cool. Um, I trade uh, some of my produce for citrus um, and then take that to market also. So it's been kind of a, a neighborhood thing going on too, which is really cool. I'm starting to meet my neighbors a lot more. And when it comes to getting rid of pests, he has his own philosophy. I've got a definite problem with pill bugs in this area. I think it's because it's newer mulch, um, and they eat a lot of my seedlings, especially the bok choy, the kales. And I'm really trying to, instead of pose my will and try to find out what will kill them, I need to find out what's out of balance because there's so many of them. Every other morning, Jim goes to pick up seaweed at a park next to the beach. It gives the pill bugs something to eat other than his garden. And it seems to be working a little bit. What I think's happened instead is they like the seaweed better than my plants. Well, the green idea of sustainability is being able to, you know, stay in an area and not um, consume more than you produce. And that's exactly what I'm doing here. I mean, very little leaves this property. So I use something called permaculture, which is um, an idea of permanent culture, which is very green. I think we're going to hear more and more about it as the years go by here. Because it's really an interconnection with everything how it used to be, um, like at a small farm. Permaculture is a concept developed in the 70s and has taken root in Jim's approach. I read a book called Guy and Garden about permaculture and the interconnectedness with food and nature and our living space. And it really changed the way I looked at the world. That's what I see permaculture is really opening the door to all these connections that can strengthen, especially our small communities. You know, because that's the human scale. I mean, yeah, I really believe that. I see the suburbs as becoming a small farm of the future. Um, it's got the infrastructure close to cities. Uh, I mean, you got water pipes, you got all the easy transportation. And you could, I mean, if you imagine this street producing what I'm producing every week, I mean, you could be you know, supplying most of the fresh food for this column. I mean, and I really can see it happening. It's really um, a fulfilling thing, and it's just building on itself. I'm just loving it. Thank you. Be sure to check out 
sure to catch our regular broadcasts of Florida Matters so yeah, Friday sure. nights at 8 and Sunday mornings at 9.30 on WUSF TV. <laughs> Jim has a, a garden in downtown Newport Ritchie, and he invites people every Saturday from 2 o'clock to 4 p.m. He invites you to his garden. You can check it out. You can learn how he gardens. He uses all free resources. He uses uh, yard, compost, mulch from the city of Newport Ritchie, as well as seaweed, like that he was talking about. And he mixes it, and it makes a, a, a soil that he grows all of his vegetables in. Um, so permaculture is major funding. Permaculture is a way to create these ecological systems that we could then sustain ourselves out of. And it and it talks about in permaculture this idea of connecting it all together. And so you have the permaculture flower. I know it's kind of hippie-ish, but this is a way of uh, them putting it together and connecting it all. So to start off with, you have the three core ethics which are care of the earth, care for people, and fair share. So if we're going to create an egalitarian system, we're going to have to learn to share more of the yield out of what we produce. Um, so care of the earth, you know, we all are, depend, like I mentioned, on the ecosystem for our food, our water, and for the, for the economy that we sustain ourselves with. So by caring for animals and plants and the earth, we're actually caring for ourselves. Every single organism on this planet has a purpose and has a reason for being. So when we you know, remove the fungus, because we don't like fungus, fungus is weird, then we remove all the decomposers that de de decompose the nutrients in the, uh, in the forest that will create more nutrients for the forest to continue growing. So we all have niches, and, we, and every animal and every person has a, a purpose for being on this planet. Uh, care for people. You know, we should create systems that care for people and are that have a purpose for that. Uh, and then fair share. Everything. The idea is that there will always be abundance. You know, if you grow a garden, you'll learn that one plant will produce ten thousand plants. So if we can learn to better share, we could all live in wealth and abundance and be thriving if we shared more. And so I'm here today sharing my information hoping that later on I'll get a connection from you and you'll share something with me or, or hopefully I'll inspire you to do something or get involved with what I'm a part of. So that's part of the fair share too, is fair share of knowledge. Um, so out of these ethics in your permaculture, uh, what you'll do is you'll look at a piece of property or you'll look at a system and you'll begin to design it using principles and your ethics. And so the principles um, there are ways for you to kind of look at the world in a different way. So one thing is to really observe and interact. So pay attention to a system and really look at it. Look at where your food comes from. Look exactly where your energy comes from. Look at where your water comes from. And then design systems to help uh, get away from the destructive things and create regenerative things. Um, catch and store energy. Harvest while it's in abundant. So it, we, um, permaculture talks a lot about rain harvesting. If we can store when the rain har uh, rains, we could store thousands and thousands of gallons of water, and then we don't have to withdraw that water from the aquifer. We can use what's in abundance if we store it and release it in small doses. And the same could be said about solar power. Right now, every single second, there's enough energy going on to the planet right now that would be so that that it would it's more energy than we use in our whole entire civilization's history that falls on the planet in the form of sunlight every single second. So if we can tap into that wealth of energy that's coming from the nuclear fusion, the star that's in the, in our uh, solar system, we could store and we could capture that energy and release it and start to have a society that's away from uh, things that are we have to have only a finite amount of. Attaining a yield. So if you're creating a system, you want to make sure that that system continues. And to, in order for that to happen, you have to make sure you're getting valuable results out of whatever you're doing. So in the gardening with uh, Jim, he gardens around his home and he obtains a yield of the garden that he grows and he sells it to local farmers markets. And that sustains the system that he's created. 
uh, self-regulate, accept feedback, be open to modifying dysfunctional behaviors. Basically, be open-minded, look in and accept when things are telling you something. So a lot of times when you're looking at a garden, you'll see leaves that are, are uh, wilting, or you'll see different colors or different patterns. And by being observant of this, you can regulate the system and do better. So for plants, plants, for example, if they have yellowy leaves, that probably means they have a nitrogen deficiency. So by being observant, paying attention, you can start to self-regulate and accept that feedback that whatever system that you're creating, whether it's a garden or a project or whatever, and these are, can be used outside of the garden. It's not just the gardening. It can be used for businesses or whatever. Uh, use invaluable renewer, renewables. Reduce dependency on scarce resources. So I, I actually owned Exxon Mobil stocks when I was growing up, and I sold them and bought a home. I think oil is really, really, really valuable, and we should use it like that. You know, we kind of use oil and not, don't even think about how incredibly powerful oil is. When you put your gasoline, when you fill up your gas tank in your car, you're using a liquid source of fuel that will transport thousands and thousands of pounds and you from where you are to your destination and back. So that when you really think about that, that energy is really, really powerful and we should use it and value it. We shouldn't just throw it away and use it without um, thinking about it. And I think because it's so plentiful, we kind of don't even think about it. But now, because the gasoline prices are going up, a lot of us are kind of thinking, oh, well maybe I should plan a trip and use my resources a lot more effectively. Get three or four things done in one day instead of just doing one thing. Um, produce no waste. So if you're creating a system, don't look at waste as something that you need to throw away. Use it. So Jim looks at the seaweed, and normally, you know, people think, oh, that's just waste. Well, he uses it in his garden, and he uses it as a material. The city mulch, um, people throw their uh, cut limbs and leaves, and they bag it up, and the city collects it, composts it, and makes a soil out of it. So nothing is waste. Everything can be reused and upcycled or recycled. Design from pattern to detail. Observe the natural patterns that are happening throughout nature and start to design your system to use them. So if you're noticing that there's certain traffic patterns or uh, water is going in certain directions, use that to your benefit. Um, I'm only slightly touching on this. If you want, I can teach a longer course because there's a lot more to teach, so I'm gonna kind of make this brief. But um, these principles are important, and the more you learn about it, the more you can use. And if you Google permaculture, there's some websites specifically about the permaculture principles where you can show, uh, see pictures and videos about how they're applied in different designs. Uh, integrate, capitalize on how things work together. So as much as possible, integrate things and get them to work together. Um, for example, I use the car as a metaphor. If you take out the brakes of your car, your brake your car is not worth anything. Because without that one system, it makes the whole other systems work. And so when you're thinking about systems or, or patterns or, or placing a garden in place, try and integrate different things. So put your rain barrel next to your garden and, and make things connect in a way so it's easier for you and easier for the system. And capitalize on things and how things work together. Um, in permaculture, they talk about like um, uh, things that will use the heat of one thing to heat up another thing. So putting chicken coops in a greenhouse will heat up the greenhouse so you don't have to use natural resources to heat it up, like propane gas or anything. So use it, uh, different things and make them work together. Uh, use small, slow solutions, local resources, and responsible at that human scale. Just like Jim was talking about, you can get really big into that huge scale of fields and agriculture, or you could bring it down to a local level of the human scale of gardens and taking care of your needs and what you, focusing on the small human scale. Um, use and value diversity. You know, like I mentioned before, everything has a purpose and a reason on this planet, so using and valuing that diversity rather than looking at it as weird or different. You know, diversity leads to greater resilience. So when you go to the grocery store, when you look at all those uh, vegetables, 
that is a small quantity of vegetables that we have created in our civilizational history. You know, you only see a couple hundred vegetables at the grocery store, but there's literally hundreds and thousands of varieties of different vegetables for every single plant. So you might have a zucchini that looks like a zebra, or you might have a purple tomato, or you might have a tomato that has like a really delicious taste, but it can't be transported for thousands of miles. So they don't even use that, and they don't put that in the grocery stores. So the diversity is lost because we try and make it a, what we can, um, the diversity is lost in grocery stores, but there's a lot to be gained by looking at the diversity. You can grow plants that have totally different tastes and different colors and stuff. And this goes with other uh, systems as well. Use edges, Bart. Value the marginal. Important things happen at the intersections. So if you're looking at forests, the area where the forest and the grasslands intersection have the highest amount of diversity. You have pioneer plants, you have plants that are tall, uh, canopy trees, you have small herbaceous plants, you have vining plants. It's always at those margins, at the edge. Um, creatively use and respond to change. So I said a lot of stuff that about how there are some difficulties and challenges we face as a generation over the next 10, 20, 50 years. But all of this is just change. And we can creatively use and respond to this change. So if we know that these problems are arising, there's got to be solutions to them. So it's up to us to be creative and respond to these and create solutions out of the problems that we see. And envision possibilities and how, how we can interact together to work on these solutions. Um, and then when you're tying these principles and these ethics, you can kind of divvy it up into different areas. So you have your, I'm not going to go through every single one of these. I'm just going to kind of skim through them. Uh, land and nature stewardship. You could do uh, holistic range management. So we were talking about desertification. Um, we took away some of the large herds that roamed the grasslands. And when we did that, they, uh, we found that the desertification intensified. So we're actually losing more and more land because we're removing cattle and herds from the grasslands. And for the longest time, we thought that having more cows and more herds would be a bad thing. But because nature, that's how nature works for thousands of years, that's how everything interacted. So holistic range management is about um, moving herds of animals around in a small area and mimicking nature. And by doing that, you can actually uh, reverse deserts and make the deserts back into the forest. And Organic agriculture, working in a small scale, using no pesticides, trying to get away from fossil fuels. Food forest gardening, trying to get, um, trying to grow food in a food forest rather than using annual plants, using more perennial plants. Uh, aquaculture, you can do aquaponics, you can raise tilapia or, or freshwater fish. You can circulate that wastewater into a hydroponic system, and it actually feeds the plants. And so you can actually create a symbiotic system by using that, mimicking how nature works. Uh, building, using natural resources, uh, earth ships, using uh, waste resources like tires and cans and glassware, and creating walls out of them, and using them in, as building materials. Um, Tools and technology, using more hand tools and appropriate technology, tools that any human being can be, uh, use. Um, using more bicycles, wood gasification. You can burn wood at low oxygen, and you can actually produce charcoal, and that charcoal can be used as an uh, energy source. Um, I'll, I'm just kind of skimming over this, but I would like to give you this URL, and if you want, you can go home and you can Google all this stuff that I'm talking about, and you can get more involved in it if you're interested. There's people who are trying this stuff out in the Tampa Bay area, and they're trying to make their own biofuels. They're gasifying wood and making charcoal and adding the charcoal to their gardens because it increases the soil fertility. So there's active learning, you know, actually participating and learning and building things together. Um, homeschooling, uh, voluntary veganism, uh, spirit, of, spirit of place, indigenous culture, really looking at how did indigenous cultures kind of uh, develop over the past 100,000 years and what were, 
what are things that we can glean from them that are uh, informative for our culture? Um, can I skim it over this? Because I think, is there any time crunch? Does anyone need to leave by a certain amount of time? Okay, I'll try and make this quicker then. Um, finance and economy, life cycle analysis, energy. Energy is a really important thing. Another thing that I wanted, uh, concept or idea. And energy means embodied energy. So like this plastic um, bird feeder, you know, it took energy to create this, and it took energy to create this computer. So what is the embodied energy in this? Like how many uh, kilojoules of energy did this use to create, and now it's here? And so when you start to account and analyze how much thing, how much energy went to create something, you can kind of think about it, and you can use, you can find systems that will use lower amounts of energy. So if you were to upcycle something, uh, use something that was already used, and and create it into something else, you're using that embodied energy, and you're actually lowering it. And so you're not you're not having to create a whole new car. You could repair your car. That would be lower uh, energy. Land tenure and community governance. Uh, you could create businesses that are more egalitarian. So, like the worker food co op, everyone owns the business. We all pool our capital. And if there's any <coughs> profits at, at the end of the year, we all get a share depending upon how much that we put into it and to invest. So, the idea is that we could create a more equality or a more egalitarian business and that we could own the business. So, you go to Walmart and you buy it from Walmart, you're never going to get a profit from Walmart. But if you go to the co-op and you become an owner and part uh, worker with the co-op and you help volunteer and you buy from the co-op, you could see a profit out of that eventually. And so the idea also is co-housing and eco-villages. Could we co-own things? Could we work together in a small community and um, work together and live together? Um, I personally have a house that I converted into like a little co-house. I have a garage apartment that I converted um, over into like a small efficiency and someone lives in that and I also rent out a room. So I live with two other people in a uh, house by myself. And so having more people living in a small area helps too. Um, going on to, so don't panic, organize. You know, I said a lot of negative things but I also tried to bring you into the positive solutions that permaculture offers. You know, if we got together, we could transform a lot of different things. And I've been noticing that as I've been going around taking YouTubes of people, there's hundreds and thousands of people that care about the planet, they care about biology, and they want to make the world better. And so if we got to organize, we could transform a lot of this. We could start community gardens. Uh, you could build community. So host a potluck, create a garden together, read one book together so you can talk about a certain subject. Post a movie, invite others to, for free to discuss important subjects. The more that we organize, the more that we get together and share what we know, the better off we'll all be. Um, so this is an idea is that on a tenth of an acre, we could produce, uh, this guy produced three tons of food. So this is just one guy producing a whole bunch of food on a small property. What could we do if we all got together and grew more gardens and grew more of these community gardens? Um, and gardening is a really easy way to make money. You can grow food, produce it, and then take it to a farmer's market and sell it. And you can make a nice side income by doing that. Um, Pick up a new skill, take up gardening. Um, there's courses where people will take you out into um, parks and they'll show you what native plants are edible. And you can look at like the different native species that are edible in our area. Um, in Newport Ritchie, we're trying to do a thing called a free school. where We're asking the community to come in and teach free classes. So like I'm gonna teach classes like I just taught right now about permaculture, but I also teach classes about food forest gardening and how to create your own garden and how to vegetable garden. So like sharing this knowledge to other people and then you can share something with me. Maybe I don't know how to make a website, but you do. Or you have a skill that you can share with me. And each one teach one. If we all teach, then we all can learn more. And then also take care of your health. Focus your energy on where your food comes from and what you're putting into your body. I, I, I'm trying to share the co-op the suncoastcoop.com, 
If you go onto that website, you can connect with local growers. They're growing vegetables, uh, dairy, eggs, meat, and they're all within Pasco, Hillsborough, or Pinellas. So what dollar that you spend has a huge impact. So if you're spending a dollar towards an industrial agriculture system, then you're supporting that system. But if you spend a dollar at a permaculture garden, then you're supporting that permaculture garden, and then you're spreading that too. So our dollars make sense when we spend it locally. And I hope that you all got something out of this. I hope you learned something, and I hope you also get involved. I have a website, Code Green Community. It's an online, free social website where I connect with people when I make YouTubes. And also the co-op you can join for free. If you're interested, we always have uh, free classes. We have volunteering uh, things that you can come to. Uh, Jim Kovaleski, every Saturday, he opens up his garden, and you can check that out. So thank you very much for inviting me out to speak with you, and I hope you all get involved. Thank you.